So I've had my PlayStation 5 console for nearly nine months now, which is just crazy. Like, how does time... Is time even real? I'm pretty sure it's not real, but anyway. Let's get into it. This is my honest review of nine months with the PlayStation 5. It's been mainly a very enjoyable experience. I wish I could say the whole thing has been just smooth sailing, but I can't. But we'll get to that in a minute. I've broken this video review down into sections, so if there are certain things you want to hear about and you don't care about the rest, feel free to just skip on ahead. I won't be offended. Let's get into it. First up, the design. I'm just gonna get rid of this box. Look, here's the box. You've seen it. If you wanna see the box some more, look at my unboxing video. All right, so here it is, the PlayStation 5. Yeah, you, you get used to it. <laughs> Most of my friends hate it. They hate this design. I don't hate it, but it's not like I look at it every morning and be like, you're a beautiful beast. You're just beautiful on the inside, and that's what counts. Most people, when they see it for the first time, comment on just how big it is. So for those of you who haven't seen a size comparison, here it is next to the original PlayStation 3, which is uh, known to be notoriously big. Overall, yeah, they're very similar this way. But again, if we compare like this, they're not vastly different. A lot of people aren't super keen on the whole black and white colour scheme, which is fair enough, but on the plus side, these faceplates come off quite easily, so there's a very good chance that Sony's going to release customizable faceplates in the future, because why have this as a thing if you weren't planning to do that? What a waste. But for the meantime, before that becomes a reality, you can always buy unofficial ones from sites like dbrand, and then you can just customise it however you like. The DualSense controller is just... Top notch, Mwah. chef's kiss. But we're gonna get to that in a second. What I find a little bit weird is that they've changed over to USB-C for charging the controllers, but they've only given us one USB-C port on the actual PlayStation 5 console. They've given us three USB-A ports and only one USB-C port. And then the charge they've given us to charge the DualSense controller is a USB-C to USB-A. And it's like, just commit to the future properly. And I mean, having USB-A port at the front, I guess means that we can plug in older accessories, so that makes sense. But surely you could fit in another USB-C port somewhere on the console. And of course, a USB-A port's probably a lot cheaper than a USB-C port, but this is meant to be the future of gaming. Why do you only have one USB-C port? I just really love USB-C. I think they're just so good. <coughs> oh, so good. <coughs> just joked on my coffee. Whew. There are already rumours that Sony is planning a PlayStation 5 redesign because it will somehow help with production so they'll be able to pump out more units, but that's all rumours for now. Personally, I'm already looking forward to the Slim. I'm really excited to see what they'll do with that redesign. But anyway... Let me tell you, ray tracing is pretty damn cool. Light looks so much more natural, particularly the way that it hits and bounces off objects. Shadows are great and reflections look beautiful. It just helps make things look more realistic and gives you that deeper sense of immersion into the world. I mean, just look at this beautiful winter setting from Miles Morales. Look at that snow. Look at the lighting. It is a very pretty game. The future of games is definitely looking bright on the PlayStation 5 and graphics will only continue to improve as developers get more and more out of the technology. For me, this is the second best thing about the PlayStation 5, the biggest improvement over the PlayStation 4. Second only to the DualSense controller. Load times are absolutely incredible, and that's because of the PlayStation 5's new SSD, solid state drive. Thing is, this quickly becomes your new standard, and that might make playing games on other consoles a little bit painful. Looking at you, Breath of the Wild. On the PlayStation 5, you can jump between games super quickly with Game Switcher and even select levels or missions to pick up from, bypassing the game's menu screen entirely. But even if you do boot up a game from the start, it's only a matter of seconds until you're ready to go. Say goodbye to grabbing a snack or a drink during a load screen because there's no time to do that anymore. The fact that you can launch a game and then be playing it in 10 to 20 seconds is pretty incredible. I think you get the point. It's very, very good. As you've probably heard, the DualSense controller is the real winner when it comes to the PlayStation 5. 
If nothing else makes you feel like you're playing the future of gaming, the DualSense will. It feels fancy and it just fits in your hand so nicely. At least it fits in my hand really nicely. This is perfect for my shape of hand. Again, your standards will quickly rise to this and then other controllers won't feel so good anymore. I used to think the DualShock 4 was so good, but I was playing The Witcher 3 the other night on this with this and it ran out of the battery. So then I had to switch back to my DualShock 4 and it just, it definitely did not feel so great anymore after using this for six months. No, no, no. And the Switch Pro controller definitely doesn't feel so pro anymore. The light bar now going around the edge of the touchpad makes a lot of sense and is a huge improvement even over the second generation DualShock 4, which had the light shine through the middle of the touchpad. At the moment, the best way to experience new haptics and adaptive triggers is Astro's Playroom. It really is just a mind-blowing experience that's really hard to describe without trying it out yourself, but I'm gonna try anyway. For example, walking across glass on Astro's pointy little feet actually feels like walking across glass thanks to the haptics in this new controller. And you even get the little tink, tink, tink of his footsteps that comes out of the speaker on here as well. And it's the same experience when you walk through grass or you wade through water. It's just, it's done so well. As for the adaptive triggers, when you use a bow and arrow, you actually feel the resistance in the trigger button as you draw the string back ready to fire. But of course, Astro's Playroom has been built specifically with the purpose of showing off these features. Other games are less impressive, particularly multi-platform games like Phoenix Rising. While you're gliding, the controller does a really nice job of creating a feeling of wind resistance. But during a lot of other situations, like scanning the map, it just feels a bit clunky. Like they've added it in just for the sake of using the new features instead of it being something that was built in organically. It just kind of takes you out of it. Spider-Man Remastered does a much better job. Swinging through Manhattan on your web feels so much more immersive with the DualSense controller. But again, I feel like you can tell this was added in later and not necessarily built in as part of the game from the start, like it was in Astro's Playroom. This will only improve as time goes on and it makes me very excited to see where games go with the DualSense in the future. I'm happy to say that Sony has recently released two new DualSense controller colors, Cosmic Red and Midnight Black. These are both absolutely beautiful in real life. They really impressed me and they're much better than what I thought they were going to look from the promotional images and video. However, I would not personally have chosen either of these colors if I was in charge of controller colors at Sony. I feel like red and black have been done to death. Like I get it, they gotta start fairly safe and then progressively build on the crazy interesting factor to keep people interested but I would have gone with something more like this. I think these are absolutely beautiful designs. I would have instantly bought either of these. I would have instantly bought both of these. That being said, I bought both of these anyway, but anyway. <laughs> to be honest, a lot of PlayStation 5 games at the moment either feel like enhanced versions of PlayStation 4 games, or they literally are enhanced versions of PlayStation 4 games. On the topic of PS4 games, it's great that a lot of developers are offering a free upgrade to the PS5 version from the PlayStation 4 version. It means that people who really wanna play a game like Assassin's Creed or Immortals Phoenix Rising, but haven't managed to get a PlayStation 5 yet, can still buy it on the PlayStation 4 and then not have to buy it again on the PS5 or have to wait to get a PS5 in order to play it. On this note though, there are some games that I really wish they'd actually release a physical PlayStation 5 version for. For example, I've been waiting to play Crash Bandicoot 5 because I thought at some point they're gonna release a PS5 version. And although they have recently announced a free PS5 upgrade for the PS4 version, there's no actual physical PlayStation 5 version available. It's not a huge deal, but it seems weird to buy a PlayStation 4 version of a game just to update it to the PlayStation 5 version instead of just buying a PlayStation 5 version in the first place. Final Fantasy VII Remake is getting a free PS5 upgrade, but it's also getting a physical release of that upgrade. So be more like Final Fantasy VII. I actually haven't played that many PlayStation 5 games. I've played Spider-Man Remastered, Miles Morales, and Immortals Phoenix Rising. I did also play Demon's Souls, but I did not finish Demon's Souls. But from what I did play, it was very, very impressive. It's definitely by far the most next-gen game that I played on the PS5. Other games that I'm really looking forward to are God of War Ragnarok, though somehow I doubt it's going to keep its 2021 release date. 
and Final Fantasy 16. And of course, Final Fantasy VII Remake Part 2. There aren't a lot of PlayStation 5 games available right now, but being able to play enhanced versions of PlayStation 4 games is definitely a worthwhile experience. Which brings me to... Funnily enough, one of the best things about the PlayStation 5 is being able to play PlayStation 4 games. So even though there aren't that many PlayStation 5 games available at the moment, there are so many amazing PlayStation 4 games for you to play. Even if they don't have a dedicated PlayStation 5 patch, the PS5 is still the best place to play the majority of your PlayStation 4 games. Now I'm going to take a moment here to acknowledge the PlayStation Plus collection. If you're a PS Plus subscriber and you buy a PS5, you get instant access to 20 of the best PS4 games, including God of War, Final Fantasy XV Royal Edition, and The Last of Us Remastered. There's a real variety of games, so there should be something for everyone. And these are on top of the free PS4 and PS5 games you get every month for being a PS Plus subscriber. If, like me, you're coming from a PS4 Slim or even a PS4 Original, there's a lot of games that have enhancements to the PS4 Pro which you wouldn't have gotten on your old console, but now you will with the PS5. And again, some developers are even patching their PS4 games so that they can make the most out of the PS5's hardware, improving frame rates and graphics, such as God of War, whose recent update gives you 4K resolution at 60 frames per second. Someone pointed out to me that frustratingly slow things like this were specifically designed to allow the next area to load in order to avoid a loading screen. So now we don't really need them, but we're stuck with them. Overall, playing PlayStation 4 games on the PlayStation 5 is a fantastic experience. It's easy to forget just how much slower load times used to be. All right, so this is how I'm getting around not being able to record the UI experience. This is the main menu. It's similar to the cross-media bar from the PlayStation 3 and 4. Are they both called cross-media bars? Anyway, it's similar to the last two PlayStations, except they sort of divide it now between, if you look up the top, we've got games and we've got media. So that's all your streaming services, your music playing, everything like that. And then it's solely games in this area, which is good because sometimes you sort of lose track of your games amongst everything else. The artwork for games certainly looks nice, but I do really miss my Final Fantasy X Remastered theme on the PS4. Yeah, themes are gone. Bummer. It does feel like they're trying to keep things a bit more subtle to keep you more immersed. So when you press the PS button in the middle of a game, it doesn't totally take you out of the experience. What I do really like is now when you screen record, it comes up with a timer at the top of the screen, so you know it's actually recording. I can't tell you the amount of times I thought I was recording something on the PS4, only to realise like an hour later that I hadn't actually recorded anything. Really frustrating. On the topic of recording, if that situation ever does happen to you, or if you just think, damn, I really wish I'd been recording that thing that just happened, you can now record up to an hour of previous gameplay. In hindsight. Pretty cool. Activity cards are interesting, but I'll be honest, I keep forgetting they exist. There are cards for jumping to certain levels or points in the game, which can be very useful and time-saving. There are also progress and hint cards, which I used once or twice when I was playing Phoenix Rising, and then I completely forgot about them and then just used Google if I needed a guide. When they announced that the PlayStation 5 was only going to have 825 gigabytes of storage, I was surprised. I was really hoping that there would be an increase on the PlayStation 4's storage, not a decrease. I was like, fingers crossed for 1.5 terabytes. Apparently not. But I thought, oh well, 825 gigabytes is close-ish to a terabyte. Like, it won't be a huge deal. But of course, when you actually turn on the PlayStation 5, the operating system takes up a big chunk of that, leaving you with just under 670 gigabytes of usable space. This is of course because it's a super fast, super expensive solid state drive. And I get that it's cutting edge technology, but it's just crazy how fast 670 gigabytes of space fills up, particularly if you're coming from a one terabyte PS4. I mean, games like The Last of Us Part Two and Final Fantasy VII Remake take up 78 and 90 gigabytes of space respectively. It's great that in the future, there's gonna be an option to easily expand the storage, but for the moment, we can't. I'm sure that in the future, as technology becomes cheaper, the PlayStation 5 will start coming with higher base storage sizes, but it's just a real shame that they couldn't fit in more storage to begin with. As I mentioned earlier, I haven't had the best experience with the PlayStation 5. 
Being a new console, I would expect there to be some level of creases that need ironing out. There'd be some issues that will pop up and that's fine, but not to this extent. I'm not sure if I have a faulty PS5 or I've just had a really unlucky run, but I've had a number of problems. The first thing happened when I was playing Spider-Man Remastered. Hmm. I was just swinging along, having a great time, when suddenly the console froze, beeped loudly, and shut itself off. Annoying, but not the end of the world, you know, random glitch, whatever. But then, I was fighting the final boss, I was about three quarters of the way through, and again, it suddenly just froze, stayed frozen for a really long time, then beeped loudly, and shut itself off. After finishing Spider-Man, I moved on to Phoenix Rising. I hadn't saved in a couple of hours, but thankfully the game auto-saved, so no stress, right? Wrong. I encountered a glitch where the game would reach a certain point, freeze, beep loudly, and the console would just reset itself. When I went to reboot the game, it had saved right before the glitch, and each time it loaded, it froze almost immediately and eventually reset itself. Not just the game, the console would reset itself. Then I had this issue for three days in a row where the PlayStation 5 just seemed to forget how to give a video signal to my TV. PlayStation is on, cords are all connected. Nothing is happening on the screen. It automatically switched channels. That's concerning. So I don't know what to do. Let me just boot it back up again. So it comes up with this loading screen when you first turn it on and then just goes, no signal. The PS5 was still on, it just wasn't giving my TV a signal. The third night in a row this happened, I had to unplug everything, leave it for a minute and then plug it all back in. Twice. And that's when it came good. And then another time, the sounds just stopped working for no reason. And not just in The Witcher, in the main menu too. The same thing happened, but this time with sound. It just wouldn't connect any sound. And the final, but by far most annoying issue is that sometimes it just makes this really loud, often high-pitched, whirring, buzzing sound. Apparently this is called coil wine. Louder than that. And some people have it, some people don't, but it is super frustrating. I've noticed that it's particularly loud when I put in a PlayStation 4 game or when it's just booting up. Look at this. That footage does not do it justice. It is so loud. So loud that I often have to turn up the TV to hear what the characters are saying over the noise of the bloody whirring. It's particularly annoying because the PlayStation 5 is supposed to be really, really quiet. But in reality, it's often a lot louder than my PlayStation 4 ever was. Thankfully, the coil line does not last forever. It does eventually stop and then go silent but it will occasionally just start up again at random points. Although all these things are really frustrating, they're not enough to totally ruin the experience for me, which probably tells you just how good the PlayStation 5 is. I just expect if I'm spending 750 Australian dollars on a console, you want it to be the premium experience. And when things like this happen, it just makes it feel a bit cheap. Yeah. We're still in that crossover period between the last generation and this generation. And in a lot of situations, you don't actually need this new generation of console to play your favorite games as they're releasing across both. Of course, as we move along through time, more and more games are gonna get released exclusively for this new generation, which will take full advantage of the features exclusive to them. If you've seen my videos before, you're probably aware that I'm a huge Final Fantasy nut. So for me, literally just Final Fantasy VII Remake Integrade makes the PS5 worthwhile. 
Square explained that the new Yuffie episode is optimized for PlayStation 5, so it is not available on the PlayStation 4. The PS5 enhanced upgrade for the main game will bring better visuals such as fog and lighting effects, as well as support for haptic feedback on the DualSense controller, amongst other things. But Square notes that it still won't be taking full advantage of the PS5, stating that we'll have to wait till part two for that, which is very exciting. Games like FF7 Remake Part 2, as well as Final Fantasy 16 and God of War Ragnarok are what really make me excited for the future of PS5. I was absolutely blown away with FF7 Remake on PS4. And if the PlayStation 5 enhanced version is still a leap away from what Square can achieve with part two on the PS5, I am really excited for the future of PS5 gaming. My absolute dream would be an FF7 Remake Part 2 edition slim PlayStation 5 console with over a terabyte of SSD storage. I might be living in a fantasy land, but we can dream. I guess the big question is, is the PS5 worth it? I'd say yes. Yes it is. The PS5 is great, apart from those issues that I've had, but a lot of people don't actually have those issues and I should probably call Sony and get it sorted, but I just haven't gotten around to it yet, okay? But overall, it's great. But if you don't have one yet, don't feel like you need to rush it. There still aren't that many exclusive games out yet. Most amazing games you can still play on the PS4, although when you do get a PS5, it is definitely the ideal way to play your favorite PlayStation 4 games. Again, I can't say it's all rainbows and sunshine. The glitchiness and the coil wine has really put a dampener on the whole experience for me. But as far as I'm aware, most people don't have the coil noise issue, so I think I'm just unlucky. If we forget everything besides the DualSense controller and load speeds, I still think it's worthwhile. Hopefully Sony will be able to pump out a decent amount of console stock soon, but I guess only time will tell. So that's my PlayStation 5 experience thus far. Let me know, has anyone else experienced these issues? Are you still waiting to get a PS5? What games are you most excited to play? Let me know your thoughts, feelings, and opinions down in the comment section below. Also, if you feel like it, give me a thumbs up, click subscribe, hit that bell. All right, bye-bye.